So it's one of the first things we talk about when I take somebody on and I talk about encounters, do you get when you compete? And some people are very upfront and open about it, and they tell me, okay, yes, I get very nervous. Um, if one sort of thing can set me off, it's whatever. I, I lose my keys, and I'm saying I'm okay, and it's done, and my brother's terrible, and it's over. Those little things are very, very easy to look after. And I say to people, typically when I take them on, we go through a plan. That's another thing, actually. I have meetings with my riders outside training. So we sit down, we have meetings maybe once a month or once every six weeks, and we go over plans, which horse shows we're going to go to, what we're going to focus on these horse shows, what expectations we have for the outcome of the horse shows, um, and then we go back to preparedness. Is this a reasonable expectation, et cetera, et cetera, how the training is going? And again, this is another thing that you have to understand. There are peaks and valleys of training with horses at that level. Sometimes they're very physically fit, they're feeling great, the training is working, everything is wonderful, and the next week you can be crashing down and things are not working. So you have to have that ability to uh, recalculate and follow. But anyway, so we talk about, let's say a month out, sorry, a month out, we go over our plan. And I literally have it where they sit down two days before they compete, they make sure there's gas in their car. They make sure they know where all their clothes are. They, the stupid stuff. My husband calls it the simple stuff. Make sure all the simple stuff is ready to go. It sounds silly, but it's the one thing that can put a lot of these riders over the edge. So we make sure all of that is buttoned up and done. We talk about a training time, a, a shipping time. We make sure everyone is on board on the team, that they know when the horse needs to be picked up, what time the horse has to arrive at the horse show. I can tell you I've had top international riders miss their class because they did not show up in time for the stabling and the job, I don't want to mention her name, but I would love to. <laughs> Let's just say that. So that's where as a trainer you can assume certain things. Uh, and I have learned the hard way, you really cannot assume anything. Make sure you go over all of the details. Uh, we had an incredible experience at uh, Rotterdam when a nose band broke. And we had an amazing room that had an extra nose band in that warm up. And we were able to get, sorry, no. we were able to get Adrian in the ring on time because that room had an extra nose band. So you have to think of all of those things. Um, so that's the simple stuff. The second thing I have to go over with my students is the silly things like memorizing a test. <sighs> We've all gone off course, right? Put your hands up if you haven't gone off course. You haven't gone off course, really? Oh, you will. Go for it. <laughs> students on the training day, okay, today we're going to think about the pre-St. George. We do the movements in order while we're training. We never throw order of movements around. Very important. And that's another hugely important thing when you're warming up actually at the horse show. Don't ever let your student ride the movement backwards in the ring, because guaranteed they will ride it backwards in the show ring. And they will go, I don't know, I don't know what happened. I rode the shoulder in the wrong way. And even though I say to them, you're doing the shoulder in the wrong way in the ring, you know that, right? You're doing the shoulder in the wrong way. And they're like, no, no, I know, I know. No, no, they don't know. So don't let them do it. Because that has happened to me as a coach too many times. Pure G, and they're doing it I. And they're like, oh. Anyway, so those things you have to really make sure you button up in the warm up. That they never ever take different patterns that they have to then ride in the competition ring. The other thing I do is I do little tricks with them. For instance, many, many riders, many riders, there go, many riders will actually go so rote in their test riding that they will take parts from the Grand Prix and ride them in the special. 
So in the, in the oh yeah, right? So we all know, right? Can I run your shoes? Yeah. No. So <laughs> um, you have to have, at least I have to have little tricks. And I say to the riders, for instance, there's one tour in the Grand Prix Special where you bend tightly. Ah. I don't know. You want to try this one? Can you hear me on that? So you have to bend tightly, and where a lot of writers will can on and go to the twos, I taught them bendy, bendy, half pass, half pass. So you take logic, okay, you're bending for the turn for your cat massage tour, you're going to can on and bend that continual logic into your half pass. And it's just enough to give those riders something that if they get a little nervous, their brain triggers right back to what you've been practicing. Another stupid little thing, a new rider coming in doing pre St. George, I'll always say before they go in, remember, Ralph, Lauren, Lauren, right, left, left. <laughs> track right, track left, track left. And I cannot tell you how many off courses I've saved just by refreshing their memory right before they go in because they're sometimes so intense with their training and getting the throatless right before they go in that that stupid pattern just eludes them all of a sudden. So never forget as a trainer, no matter how advanced your rider is, make sure you are taking time to go over the pattern. The other thing that I have to come up with, I have to work with a lot with not only my riders, but the horses, is that the added increase of pressure. Pressure is tough. Um, as a coach, though, we have to find ways to help our students and our riders deal with the added pressure. So when I'm first starting, It's very sensitive. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> um, so I, uh, we always map out a program, a protocol for the horse for the season. But at some point, if you want to get better, you're going to say, okay, when you first go in, it's basically an information gathering project. We're going to go in, see how you're doing, see how the horse is doing, see how you're coping, see how everyone's, everyone's happy, where your pitfalls may be, where the holes may be, you go home, you work on that go up next game plan, but at some point you're going to have to say, to improve that score, we need to start showing the judges the improvement we made at home. So, we talk about training to maybe make that pirouette better. So a pirouette is a great movement, it's a coefficient movement, there's a lot of points there. If you can irk it or eke it up from a 7 to a 7.5 or a 7 to an 8, that's a really strong movement. And I typically start with a horse, the strong movements to put the pressure on. Never the weak. Your five walks, never going to be nine. Don't worry. You can train and train, it's not going to be nine. But your 7 can pirouette, might be an 8 can pirouette with a little bit of tweaking. And it's a very small little place to put a bit of pressure with a great reward for the rider and the horse with the expectation of a higher score. And here's what we do next. We go home and we practice warming up with that added pressure to make that pirouette great. That's not something you say, hey, Olivia, this is a test. We're gonna work on that camera pirouette today. It's gonna be eight. eight. That's not gonna work. That's gonna fail. <laughs> But what you can do is you can say, okay, we're warming up for the pre-St. George. We're going to work on that can pirouette to be, that half pirouette to be a, an eight. We're going to go in the ring at 3.01. We're going to get on at 2.30. We're going to warm up and we're going to see what these exercises we're going to do. At 3.01, when you can't get in the sound and you write that test, is the pirouette better or is the pirouette worse? You have to practice with your warm-up at home. So you train the warm-up and not just the training of the horse. That's a very important thing to remember. You can't expect that 30 minutes in, your horse is just going to be amazing, whether it's raining or it's pouring or it's sunny or it's hot. You have to be prepared and you have
have to practice. So we do this, I would say, once every two weeks to once every month, depending on the level of the horse. We run training days and we play around with uh, warm-up times, warm-up uh, practice sort of movements, uh, where we're focusing, how much walk time, and it's literally a train, it's a timed event, sorry, timed event, so I'll say, okay, five minutes of walk, da 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 and again, it's a little feedback from the rider, because the rider will say, oh, it feels a little this, maybe we should try this, but we map the whole thing, and then we also keep records of it, because if we had a great ride, we want to be able to look back at what we've done. So that's one thing that we do, is we really train our warm-up for a certain event that we're ready for. And sometimes, for instance, for the Olympics, if it's 95 degrees out with 100% humidity, you're trying to get that, that warm-up time as short as you possibly can with the best um, effort, with sort of the best result, because you don't want to make the horse exhausted. So there's things like that that you have to take in, into account. Um, I would say the one thing that I hear time after time is I had a great warm-up my test was not good. That's uh, information for the coach who meant the warm-up was a failure. A failure. How do we get the warm-up to be the correct warm-up for the best test? Um, and I think that is something that only happens with training for that actual program. And I think that's super important. The last thing I'd like to talk about is that at this level, as a coach, you have to be super open to a team. And a team means giving that horse and rider all the support that that horse and rider need to be their very best. And that means if they're nervous, please call Dr. Laura King. Maybe she has some insight that, as Lennon said, we became coaches because we love coaching and riding, but I didn't get a psychology degree. Maybe there's something it's a little bit I don't know. So maybe someone can help there. Maybe they're struggling with the canopy wet. I may call Olivia and say, Olivia, have you ever had this situation with this rider? I'm struggling, they're struggling. Olivia might say, no, but Ali Brockos, bring in Ali. Um, veterinary stuff, making sure the horse is as healthy as it possibly can be. The blacksmith, everything. The team has to work together. And if you're one of those coaches that thinks you can do it all on your own, you can't. If you look at the top people in the world, they have a team of coaches. Jesse has a Piaf coach, and a this coach, and a Campirouette coach, and a team coach, and a sub-team coach, and a brother watching her. The, the, the best people are eager and curious for more and more information. When we have a test, for instance, the horse show this weekend, always get it videoed. Always. I know if you're like me, you're like, there's a camera's video, a camera's video, a camera's video. <laughs> and I'm having a camera's video. Oh. Watch it once with all your critical eyes, and then you watch it twice, and you're like, okay, that's pretty good. That's okay. And you kind of, okay, you can watch the whole thing now. You can watch the whole thing. <laughs> But it takes, it's hard to you, like you're your own friend, right? It's hard. Um, but all I'm saying is watch your video. Um, and the last thing that I wanted to share is that I read an incredible book um, about how our brains work um, as far as being coached and uh, struggling with learning new things and, and really trying to be the very best you can be. And there was one chapter where it talked about how if you actually visually saw something being done in a perfect way, and you kept watching that thing done in a perfect way, so it could be your best talk, half pass, or is it over its test, or maybe something that you think is perfect, and you watch that, and then you go to bed and sleep well, young things, please sleep well. Um, your brain actually learns how to process and do it in your sleep. And it's free. <laughs> <laughs> okay, it's free. And your horse is playing, not the big one, no, just saying, maybe. <laughs> so nobody is doing any work but your brain. So again, watch. 
watch videos, um, be the best partner you can for your horse, train well and kindly. That's the other thing that I think is so prevalent in our sport right now, that we're training our horses in a kind and fair manner, that we're not overtraining them, that we're not overdoing it because of crazy expectations that maybe are not fair to that animal. Um, so that would be my, my takeaway is that the, uh, at the eye level, rider is still human and uh, have, we have all our challenges, but if we were together as a group, we will be the best we can do. Thank you, Ashley. Now, let me tell you, the next, yeah. the next three people are going, I was going to say that. Yes. I was going to say that. <laughs> <laughs> Ashley's off the hook. Okay. So, Olivia, do you have something to add? You're on. I'm on. Okay. <laughs> My topic is teaching the junior young rider sort of um, young adult at the FBI levels, basically. Yeah. Sounds good. <laughs>
order to make your students sit up straighter, not because they are scared, but because they feel confident and empowered, and they should never feel less than. Um, Allie and I talk about the shark eyes spot, that helping youth develop what we call shark eyes, which is that place where they click in to where they feel like they're laser focused and confident, and know how to attack their tests with precision and feel in the zone. And that goes into a lot of what Ashley was talking about, about having a plan and being super prepared and then feeling confident in that plan. Um, I do a lot of pushing and holding them to a really high standard of training, riding, position, and conduct but balance that with a lot of encouragement and empowerment and being clear that I hold them to that standard because I believe in them and their abilities. Uh, and making sure there's playfulness in the training and the communication. Um, okay, this is a big one for this generation, managing social media. This is a big thing for these kids and not something that even my generation um, grew up with but that it's really important going forward. Um, I am not overly active on social media, um, so I have had to work at this. I do follow my students. I don't stalk my students, but, <laughs> <laughs> uh, but I think it's, uh, it's really important to talk about it. It can be incredibly toxic for these kids because everyone looks amazing on social media for five seconds. Um, it can be not a very nice place. It can also be a very encouraging and uplifting place. So I think learning, like teaching them how to have a positive interaction with it, but not getting sucked into it, you know, making a plan for that during big competitions, like does the parents get the phone, like, and also having a relationship with the parents around the social media. Um, some kids and families are very active on it, and so I think just having a big conversation. My my cousin is a, a, been a, a professional softball coach for many years, so she's worked with this age range of 10. She works at college level, so a little older. So um, we're talking more teenagers. She works more with, you know, like you're allowed to drink at that age, but she has <laughs> a rule of the 3D. She calls it, you know, Foods, butts, or beer should be seen on social media, which I realize that's, you know, this is a younger age bracket, but it does go in on that. Um, remembering that colleges and jobs will be looking at your social media. Um, I also had it with one student that she had multiple social media accounts, and one was all courses, and one was more like beach pictures. And then the second one was not private, and I went through, just happened to see what she had posted, and I was a little like, okay. <laughs> and I talked to her mom, who was great, and, um, but what I noticed was she had a lot of, like, region seven was following her, and a couple of judges, and it was like, okay, so if you're going to have a private account, it needs to be private,
corner and short sides. I find that teaching them to maximize the arena between movements talk a lot about that because especially when you're moving up to the FBI, like that young writer's test, I think they got like one short side in the hand. It's like corner, corner, corner. So like really knowing how to work the arena between the movements is super important. Um, and helps keep them more present. Like if you know what you're supposed to do with every single step in that test, like even if something goes wrong, it's easier to find your place again. Um, I made them tell me the test super fast. How fast can they recite it? Uh, it's kind of uh, makes me feel confident they'll be able to recall it really quickly if they need to. Um, last couple of things, it's your responsibility as a coach to find a way to communicate a concept in a way that lands for them. They need to meet you halfway if they don't understand something, if they tell you they don't understand it. Use analogies, demonstrations, Start with the simplest description I can and then get more detail from there as needed. Ask, um, ask for feedback. What do they feel? Do they like the feel? What do they change? And what do they like and not like? You know, how do you flex out? Like, is your horse truly sound before they send to the event? There's nothing that's heartbreaking for a kid to show up to these big events and not have the horse be sound enough. It's also very sad for the rest of the team. And also, we want to just take really good care of our partners. Um, and my last one is teach them about jogs and what a draw time is. <laughs> I, I had it where one of my kids, we went to a small CBI, and the dad's going, Your right time is blank, your right time is blank. Well, that was the class time. <laughs> so, it wasn't the jog time. Let's say, or it wasn't the ride time. We made it to the ring just in time. And this kid was made of steel and like literally tried it from the barn around the arena and did the test because uh, we had not gotten the ride time right because we had been going off the class time and on the draw time. So those little things are also really big things and very important. So, and then my last one actually is managing expectations. If you've got a kid doing, you know, this team stuff is, you know, like being very supportive, but also being realistic about, you know, where that horse is likely going to stack up when you show up for something that's going to be judged as a CDI. And, um, and that isn't to be like a put down or a put up, but it's, it helps the kids be better sportsmen, better teammate, better everything if they, they have a realistic view. And that's not to say you don't go and do your absolute best, you absolutely will. But um, but it's important just to have like, a clear idea, you know, and be, be happy with your own journey, you know, and help them be happy with their own journey. Okay. Um, I, we can give her a hand. <laughs> I forgot to say in the beginning, um, we will have a time for a few questions that I hope we will keep to the subject. Um, those of you that pre-registered, I'd ask, we'd asked on the application, what is the one thing most important to you for a coach to know about coaching you at a show? Some of you answered specifically that question, and some of you went a little broad. Um, but. I think what I'd like to do, I was going to read some of those, but I think what I'd like to do is have questions because what you have written to us gives me some ideas of some other things we might be doing within the uh, T for T, uh, training for teaching program. So having said that, each person that goes now is challenged not to uh, <laughs> repeat everything. So. Thank you all for coming. And um, I will be talking this evening about Um, I have sort of a, a, a very, um, uh, I've been teaching and coaching about amateurs pretty much my whole life. My mother is a trainer and I grew up even coaching and teaching them when I was really feeling too young to, to do that. <laughs> but um, uh, Para is new to me. I've only been, I've only started with Para Riders since 2019. And when I was first asked to, um, coach one of our top pair of riders for, for um, Tokyo, I thought, oh my gosh, am I qualified for this? Like, I don't know, I have no experience. So um, we started off and we did a 
very short amount of time, I was like, oh, I'm totally qualified for this. <laughs> but we all have our limitations, and certainly, you know, I've been teaching adult amateurs, but some of them more limitations than the rider I started teaching, um, my first pair rider. So um, I've really enjoyed um, working with the pair riders. I've, I've only worked with five riders, all the way from grade one to grade five. Um, and I thought I'd take this moment to explain the grades in case you all don't know. I, before being a part of the parallel world, I had immense um, just awe of what they do. They're often at our able-bodied shows and, and I just can't believe what they do. It's amazing and I'm really happy to be a part of it. But anyway, so uh, the, the, the uh, grades run from grade one through grade five. And grade one is most disabled, and they, 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 their um, test is Justin Walk. It's in a small arena, and Justin Walk. Um, grade two is the next grade, and they have about 70% walk and about 30% trot. And grade three, all, also in a small arena, grade three, also in a small arena, has probably 70% uh, trot and 30% walk. And they're difficult tests. I mean, very. You know, I mean, try doing a walk through it with no use of your legs. You know, they're very, very difficult tests. Um, and frankly, as y'all know, a walk, you know, it, mm. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's probably, I struggle. I mean, I struggle. You know, you're like, can I work on my walk here? Right? So you're like, oh. <laughs> yeah. It is really like the most difficult case. So in uh, grade four moves on to a, a large arena, and um, it is probably, it's hard to, to equate it to one of uh, the able-bodied tests, but I would say it's a, it's a difficult second-level test. It does not have flying changes, but it has some half-passes, which, um, and, 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 and they're just difficult um, lines. You know, it's a real rider test. Um, and then grade five is most able-bodied, and that's like a third, fourth level test. And you know, in my experience, you know, I mean, grade five with the right horse is pretty able-bodied. You know, so many of them you won't even know, you know, what their disability is. Um, and you know, as you can imagine, it's a very imperfect system. You know, especially the first time when I went to Tokyo, I was like, well, how can that person be? You know, it is, it is, a, it, it's, it's difficult to put everybody on the same level playing field. Um, but anyway, it's, uh, um, I really enjoyed it. So anyway, uh, coaching. Start, start with, being that I have those two subjects, I'm going to kind of just talk as one, but I would say that with, the, with oh, I turned it off. Don't. You guys are You guys are squeezers. <laughs> <laughs> you know, a lot of them, my pair riders fall under, you know, more Ashley's um, topic because they are fighting at an international level. But anyway, for me as a coach, I want to show us some very simple things. You know, I want to be, I show up early. Um, I make sure my sound system is working. I want, I don't want to be part of their stress, any stress. They have me be able to count on me. I keep them apprised of the time, how much time you have left, which course you follow. Um, you know, making sure that they're feeling like ready, ready and clear. Um, so, and knowing, just as you guys said, knowing your student, you know, what motivates them. Do they need to be, um, you know, reassured and, and, and given confidence, or do they need to be pushed a little? You know, those are those are some things that you you know learn from working with your rider over time, and as you said, talking to them, as assuming that you're getting the honest answers. students for positive things. So sometimes you don't think like, <clears throat> to tell your student 
how to excuse himself from the rain. I <laughs> think things are going really bad. And you're not going to be okay. But things are going really bad. Here's what you do. So we had a student that was doing them. I think it was a fourth level test. And it's hard to imagine that you could be doing a fourth level test and not know how to do this. But her horse would not go beyond like R and S. And it was so bad. And she was straight as the test went on, and it was just so bad. And my mom and I are like on the side going, huh. <laughs> <laughs> trying, trying to get in her line of vision, you know, but she's like this. She's so ashamed, and she's just hunched over. <laughs> so we were like, listen, <laughs> you don't have to put yourself through that. But anyway. <laughs> Um, anyway, um, a lot of um, also the um, preparation obviously comes at home, test writing, encouraging the appropriate level to be competing. That can be tough sometimes. You know, sometimes um, you know, people will be like, oh, all right, you know, for, for the point, and you're like, really? You know? <laughs> <laughs> so, you know, I, I, you do need to help your students um, be in a place where they're their goals are, are um, uh, you know, consistent. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Exactly. exactly, exactly. So um, another thing that can be really tough too is, and I find this especially with adult amateurs, is you know we work so hard on getting the connection right and the horse in the right frame and in front of the leg to be able to um, ride through this test, and then when they start riding through the test things start falling apart, and then you like, you know, you're like, I'm not a big fan of practicing it poorly, and you practice pulling it off, like, you know, that's, so that can be a little bit tough, too, and, and, and I find, like, those, I don't know if you guys know about those schooling shows that they have at White Fences, where you can keep the headset on with your coach, that's amazing, that they're on Wednesdays, once a month. And like I have one student too that she she was reading her best test. Because when we go to an open show, I read the test for her. But she has so much trouble um and she's a smart lady, you know, it's nothing to do with it. She's so much trouble trying to figure out where to go and what to do and how to ride it. But when we when I, when we do these shows, I'm sorry, I'm cold. <laughs> Um, when you do these shows, I can say, okay, and you're going to track left, and you're going to get them a little bouncy and ready for the extension coming up in the corner, and then, you know, of course she can't, she has trouble making it all the way on that path, path, so it's like, so you can leave a meter or two early. Let's get there. But, um, you know, those shows are amazing, and it's just been, like, those are definitely her best performances, and I think that's super, super valuable tool that everybody here should, should use and, and um, take advantage of. Um, and then, you know, I'm a big one of visualization for myself. Like, I like to sit quietly and ride for my test. Um, it's always perfect. <laughs> but you, you can, there's only, I always tell my students, there's only so many times you can, you know, school that line of changes or school whatever it is you're, you're trying to be better. You know, in fairness to your course, and you know, it doesn't always feel better when we school it more. So um, I find um, encouraging my students to um, visualize their tests. And, and to go through, it was interesting because I liked Olivia. She said, How fast can you um, recite it? And I think that's a really cool tool. And sometimes, you know, going through it, not just like, oh, you know, C track left. And, you know, it's, you, you go through it like how you're going to ride it and how you're going to prepare for each movement. And, you know, really, um, so that you can, you can exercise that in the show ring. Better, I think, if you spend that time preparing for it. And then another thing I was going to say was already said about you know riders with major nerves. You know, I do have a psychology degree, but I'm not working. <laughs> <laughs> so I mean, I also work with a psychologists. You know, so I, I encourage my students to you know get that help. And you know, the, especially you know, especially you know, well, I shouldn't say especially. But the you know the pair riders who are riding at 
a very high level and a lot of pressure, as actually mentioned. You know, and can you imagine, like, not knowing, I mean, all of us, our bodies are a little bit different each day, but some of these riders, the anxiety it causes to be like, how am I going to feel that day? Or how did I sleep? You know, that can be, there's so many major factors. And, um, you know, so those those are, oh, and another thing that's really interesting, just um, the high performance para versus able body is the way that the teams are selected at the CPEDI's international competitions. As soon as the job is over, they're only allowed to school in situations where they're schooling in front of the um, selectors. So I, I think that's really difficult. So they're actually schooling in front of the people who are selecting the team. And sometimes you need to not look so good, you know, or, or you need to do something. And I feel like it encourages them to be like, I'm show, show ready all the time. So that can be, I think, really difficult, like even psychologically, to go to say, like, well, I, I'm going to do it. I'm going to ride my horse a little, you know, lower or more round because I know I'm going to have this problem with, you know, we know the slackers are there looking at you and it can be, you know, really stressful and I wish they didn't feel that. So, um, yeah, I think that that's about it. Thank you. Okay, thank you, Jen. <laughs> Hold it softly. <laughs> Hi, thank you everybody for coming and I'm so honored to be on this panel. Thank you, London, for inviting me. And thank you to all the ladies. I've been taking notes, like I'm a participant. <laughs> and everybody knows that when I have kids doing stuff, I take so many notes and I take pictures and send them to their parents <laughs> and really just stay on it. But um, like, there are so many things. I am focusing on the low level kid rider today. I teach all kinds. Then just everybody's notes, or my notes on everybody, there really is a lot of overlap. Like, actually, I wish I knew about Ralph the Rambler. Right? <laughs> <laughs> I would have got my silver quicker. <laughs> I was stuck on Loren, Loren, Loren. <laughs> That's kind of how I feel about Ralph the Rambler. Yelling at me. <laughs> a lot of great points, and Olivia, don't pop down to you. That's something, even though I have super young riders, too, like seven, eight years old, I don't talk down to them. I treat them like, you know, I don't, not like an adult, we don't talk about adult topics, but I, <laughs> <laughs> but I respect that they have the ability to sit up straight. You know, I have high expectations from the beginning, because I think that's important. And I'm also encouraging. Um, and then I also, I have some great assistant instructors in my barn that are teens and tweens. And because we don't want to make it too serious, but we want these high expectations. And so we alternate in teaching with having some younger coaches as well to relate to them. And, and that's, that's how we keep them motivated because if they, uh -oh. Hello. <laughs> <laughs> because if they just had me uh, with my high expectations, it, you know, we want to get them to actually, so we want them to enjoy the journey and remain positive the whole time, not just drill. So we incorporate games and we also do playing clubs, so we focus on teamwork as well and doing things together. Um, and Jen, all these great comments about preparing for tests. How long do you have? I swear, I try to mentally talk to the judges when they ring the bell. Please don't ring it when they're break by the yeah. Please don't. Please don't. And they always ring it just as they pass the entryway. And every kid, no matter how many times I told them, they just went right around. You know, people are thinking I'm a terrible coach now. I told you that. <laughs> Um, but one thing about coaching at shows, really, once you're at the show, that's the tip of the iceberg, right? The 
the proverbial tip of the iceberg, most of the preparation is happening way before the show. And that's probably another topic in a way that we've all touched on, things that we do. Um, I think the thing that might be a little bit different with the kids is that I'm doing a lot of firsts. First time in the ring, first time at a show, first day, first time learning how to say the word massage. Um, <laughs> yeah, lots of firsts. So, and I want it to be positive because I think this is a great sport. I think massage is great for a horse and rider, um, making them the best they can be and can transfer to any sport in their future. So, I am in a big component of making dressage fun and positive. Um, so, preparation is always key. I, some, the parents sometimes come to me, so that's the other thing with kids. You're not just coaching a kid, but you're coaching the parents. Um, so you have to incorporate the parents, they're equally important. And, no, song is the right word, but you have to like sell the parents that this is a great place for the kids to learn all these great life lessons because it is it's a safe place to learn great life lessons. I mean, in one weekend you can go from year to year, and then you learn to survive. Um, <laughs> the coach learns to survive too. And some teams are hard, um, <laughs> but. Um, so the, the parents are as important as the kids. It's important, it's positive. Um, and I try to focus on success and defining success. So we meet when they decide they want to compete and um, talk about what our goals are and what is success because everyone has their own journey. Kids get competitive with each other. And I try to emphasize it's not about competitive with each other, it's about your own journey and how you're going to win for yourself, and winning may be just staying in the ring, or reminding them, hey, if two feet are out, it's okay, just get back here. <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> even three feet, even, some judges like to win really long. <laughs> but, and I accuse them that all four feet are out of the ring. That's right. I actually know that. <laughs> Say judges are our friends, 
and <laughs> just, it's another perspective and very helpful that you share with us. So, you know, to get to the competition, you have to educate them, and this is the first show, so I'm educating them about the judging scale. Um, trying to explain that I love your 12 hand Appaloosa pony very, very much, <laughs> but he's not getting me a 10 down the center line. <laughs> and you just have to make sure your technique is excellent. Um, but so we talk about things, I talk to the parents about it too, because the parents are like, oh, why did your Susie not win? Uh, it's not about winning. <laughs> <laughs> She did a great 20 meter circle with no corners. Let's, let's celebrate that win. So, and it's emotional. There's emotions involved, especially the teens and the tweens. And I try to remember my teens and tweens years. Who said that? Olivia, you're supposed to remember that. I'm, I try, and I, I do. Um, it's just. <laughs> I'm going to win. This is my best shot at the regional championships. And the house next to the arena decided to put on a new roof. <laughs> so we never did make it to see. <laughs> Forward where we need to get 
And then the ponies become smart and they know that they can do whatever they want once again. <laughs> those are our goals. <laughs> um, and the other thing for preparation is I make sure I have a board that does time. Time for when you're ready at the barn and in the warm up. So, um, and I try to make that all positive as well. I talk to the parents, make sure they're at a show at a certain time. It's really important that parents have a job. Mm -hmm. And so they can bring drinks, any kind of drink, <laughs> snacks. I have one parent that's really good at these salads in a jar. It's amazing. Um, so you you want the kid to be there, and I have the kids actually walk the test and they judge each other. That's kind of fun. Because yeah. you're physically doing it and talking it through, and then the other kids are judging it. <laughs> because they're friends. <laughs> <laughs> and then when a horse and rider needs to be in the home grand, give parents a job, it's okay. So, first show, we just celebrate they made it. We try to keep it simple. Um, and then as they progress, I do start focusing on specific things. Like maybe we'll work on corners. Let's do corners to show. Um, let's do round circles. <laughs> we talk, we've also, it's the training skill, right? Forward. And then we start working on um, relaxation, suppleness. Hopefully we get to that. And then <laughs> connection through stretchy circles, demonstrating excellent connection. And, and through counter kinder loops, um, you know, it's, these kids, they are very capable, so that's why I come back around to. You don't need to talk down. You can have high expectations because they're processing. They want to do the best they can, so I just try to support them to do the best they can and challenge them. They like to be challenged. If they're not challenged, then it's not really that fun for them, I, I think, even, um, and it's amazing to watch them develop from the quiet kid that's there. You don't know, do they really like horses? Um, and then there's, then two years later, like, you can't get rid of them. They're just, like all over the horse. And so it's so fun to see them develop. Um, and it really comes from, it's a team. It is a team. And I, I bring in people too. I bring in people to help me with equitation because I think position is very important. So I really focus on position for my, not only my kids, but my adults. It's a great foundation. And um, I think that was said over and over again today at the trainers conference too. That's how you give your best aids. Anyway, I, I, I'm off topic now. So um, that's all I have. <laughs> I think a lot of us are wishing that when we first started riding, we were riding with Marsha, yeah. right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Instead of my sister beating me up. <laughs> um, I have I have one question before we open it up, and. Um, I'm just, I'm, this is a curiosity and whether this is, I'm asking you all if it's something you did or you had students that do, but some riders have, have a, a, a little program, a system they go through before they get on, you know, whether it's listening to music or sleeping in the car or whatever, and I wonder if you all might share any thoughts, any ideas, anything that, whether it's something you do or it's people you know that did, just throwing out quick ideas. You want to try that microphone again? Or maybe don't give it to Ashley? <laughs> um, yes, I have a, a routine that I go mm -hmm. through. Um, every time I meet with if I don't do the routine because I think I know the horse, I know this, I, it fails. So I always do this routine. Um, the night before, I again I run through watching videos that I have prepared that I think are the right videos for you to watch. Um, the day of the competition, I make sure that I back it up time-wise that two hours before I compete, I'm ready. Meaning I have all of my clothes on that are my show clothes. I then go to a quiet place. My show clothes, definitely. 
It doesn't have to be you, Olivia, or someone, or anything. No, I'm afraid that. I'm afraid that. I, I do this thing. I learned it from my old boss, which is not, it's not as, uh, not as much of a routine, but she goes in and goes What's on the playlist? What's on the playlist? <laughs> What's on the playlist? Oh, you know, I've got it. Um, well, this one is thanks to my kids, Shake It Off. <laughs> Brave by um, Sarah Borelli. Uh, I don't know how to say people's names very well. Um, try and Pink. <laughs> We love Wake Me Up, High Hopes, um, it's another, I like the middle, they say it's too old. <laughs> um, <laughs> they like centuries. <laughs> um, cowgirls don't cry. <laughs> uh, I like, um, I like Break My Shine, I just try not to listen to all the words. Um, <laughs> Have it all. So you, you gotta be careful about words. Like go over the lyrics. <laughs> so, Marsha was saying that having the wonderful mother parents that you know had a job. I did have the wonderful adult amateur when I had a group that went to all the shows, and her job was to bring the mimosas in the morning, <laughs> uh, mostly for herself. <laughs> um, but uh, yeah. So. Um, I'd like at this time to open it up to any questions. I just ask that it not be 
what I call the Dear Abby questions, that it's totally personal to a situation, but something that could be for the group about coaching and showing and being coached. Yes. Coach? Would you mind standing up so everybody can hear you? Do you coach and ride at the same show? And if so, how do you balance that? Okay, let's, Ashley, you want to, yeah. Hand, yeah. I think we can share, we can try to use both mics, yeah. I coach and ride and I compete against my own students, which a friend of mine said the other day, well, that's not fair. If that's fair, they don't beat me. <laughs> Microphone? I think sometimes they found out that they actually liked being warmed up by my assistant more than me. <laughs> <laughs> and you have to swallow that and, and have that feedback from them. Some people just like other people better. <laughs> yeah. didn't show up, I was in a state of panic, and so I don't want my students, 
I mean, anything can happen. You know, they yeah. Yeah. step on a rock and break their ankle and can't show up, whatever. Um, so one thing that I do with the kids that I work with, you know, on a long-term basis, we do little in-house schooling shows fairly regularly, get someone to come in, and they're very, very informal, and they had to warm up by themselves. They have to do it completely by themselves. And, and you know, it's just a little schooling show, it's not a big deal, and at a, at a regular show, I'll try to be there, but what if, what if I don't make it? So I don't want them to be in a total state of panic um, if they have to be on their own. And sometimes, again, they find out they're pretty darn good by themselves. Did you have anything? Oh, when we have a big bird, I'm, I'm a big component of the U.S. Honey Club, and that's part of their ratings is they have to warm up on their own. They have to explain their warm up. They have to say why. They have to go through the training scale. So mm -hmm. they're educated, yeah. Question? Anybody? In the back there? If you'd stand up, please. I would love to know the name of the coaching Oh, yes. Yes. Okay. While she's doing that, another question? Yes. Stand, please. Yeah. Do you distinguish between lessons and coaching? And do you have any kind of pricing structure for your coaching? Who wants to start with that? Um, so, in terms of pricing structure for the way I run my program is if you're in full training, you're in full training. If we have to go away for a show, like way away, then I have to think, I think I build that like usually as a lesson. Like if I'm like, hey, young riders with one student, like that kind of thing. Um, if they aren't in full training, I build it as a lesson. If I'm there, if I just do it online, it's usually The book it's why we sleep, but I don't know that authors do why or why. Why we sleep. You just Google it, it comes up and it shows you that you sleep during the first 30 minutes. When you're sleeping, the first 30 minutes learning. Your brain is in a state of learning. That's why listening to anything when you go to bed at night or listening to things you want to fall asleep the TV on is really bad for your brain. So you want something productive when you're falling asleep because it's called the first 30 minutes is absorbed. It's called sleep learning. Okay. So it's about why we sleep and it talks about how you coach with that. Other questions? Yes. Tony. Tony, could you stand? Yeah. And
sometimes doing something the coach is telling you that feels the antithesis of what you actually should do, you should just grip in and believe. Just believe for a second, or believe for five minutes, because it worked. And it's amazing. <laughs> different horses, which helps me become the rider I am today, and off-track thoroughbreds, I just took whatever, and I had no fear. I, like, I look back now, I'm like, oh, God, um, jumping gates, because I didn't want to open them, and, um, <laughs> but it, it's been a journey, and it, it, my coaches, I was very fortunate. Um, I also rode saddle seat, and those saddle seat coaches are in the Hall of Fame, now in the Chicago area, or Midwest, UPHA, whatever it is. Um, but I love them like my mother. 
Um, don't tell my mother. But they were like that. It was just a supportive family. And that's what I remember. And that gave me the positive experience and desire to stay and, and help keep growing this sport and growing kids. For me, it wasn't a coach as well, sort of. Um, back in the dark ages when I was on Olympic teams, uh, we didn't have sports psychologists, nutritionists, uh, you know, we just rode our horses and went in the ring and did our thing. But we did have, Laura, a, I have no idea who it was, a sports psychologist that talked to us because, of course, when you're on an Olympic team, I mean, for some people, that's the first time they're in a team situation or North American Young Riders. And the, the added pressure of, first of all, not letting down your teammates, not to mention the fact that you're representing the United States of America. Um, and that person said something that, that has always stuck with me. He said, um, go in your, your bathroom and fill your bathtub up with about this much water. And then step in it. And if your foot goes through the water into the porcelain, you're allowed to make a mistake. In other words, if you walk on water, <laughs> you're not allowed to make a mistake, perhaps. And that's always stuck with me. You know, if I, my foot's going to go through the porcelain, it's okay if I make a mistake. Um, and uh, I, don't, I don't remember anything else he said, but uh, <laughs> I remember that. Now, we've, we've gone, should we have one more question? Because we're, we're kind of out of time. No, nobody's raising their hand. So, oh, okay, you blew it. <laughs> Stand up, please. Um, any good strategies other than just kind of the general talking to them about expectations? Um, how to deal with like, the very intense parent that makes the parent <laughs> doesn't work again I'm very good at giving people jobs I've had people put up fence cut, cut logs um, <laughs> painting that's a good one um, but it, it needs to be managed because it's um, it's a real issue it can be a real issue it's very it can be very serious and that's also part of my education to talk to them about what it means to compete in the judges scale and really the life lessons that we get from it and to allow it to happen and that there's every kid has their own trajectory however it goes right and um, you have to let it evolve uh, I, I mean I have like I had a grandparent get really frustrated her kid wasn't raining back correctly and it must have been the way I was teaching it and I said Nip. So you gotta let it happen. You gotta let the kid evolve. It, I know instincts say, "I'm going to pull on the reins," and that's not the right way to back. Um, and so finally, I was like, "Listen," and I got on the horse. And I said, "See, I trained the horse correctly. No hands backing, but um, it takes time, and you have to allow the kids to develop into it. It's just not magic." And everybody who's been trained knows you can talk about outside hands all day long, but nobody believes you, kind of like the flying change thing, until all of a sudden it clicks one day. Anyone want, Ashley? Are you the intent parent, intense um, parent? Yeah. <laughs> Oh, everything can go wrong. <laughs> um, and I think it's about educating the child. 
educating that parent. Um, and I said, listen, your child is an incredible rider, and she's very talented, and she's on a great horse. But there are many things that can happen, and she does not have a very big toolbox yet. And I talk about this toolbox all the time, which means if a situation arises, if you've had that experience before, you then learn what to do about it. But if the experience never arises, you have no idea what to do about it. So I said, your child is going to have to fail sometimes for her, her to become the rider she needs to be in the future. Having her just go in and win, as great as it is, is really not creating the rider we need her to be in the future. So sometimes failing, and everyone hears this, failing is the way to success. In a way, the parent has to be taught why it is the, the, the road to success. This rider literally goes in and rotates too many times in a canopy row. <laughs> okay? And I looked at the parent and I said, isn't that great? I'm like, actually, no. And I had to train and say, no, she over-rotated and now she's going to get a zero for that loop, but unfortunately, well, how can this happen? And I said, because she's nervous and it's a championship and now she will never do it again. <laughs> and that's how you get better. So I think educating the parent um, and again, putting expectations. I'm, I don't want to drill on, but I'll say, listen, I've done this forever. I'm a 70. I'm thrilled. You think your daughter, who's done it for two years, is going to get a 70 every time she comes out? I mean, that makes me look like a total idiot. I've done this for so many years. I said, so that's, again, it's managing expectations. And then showing them top riders in the world. These are the scores they're getting. Do you expect to run your first marathon and come in in two hours? You're making it lucky one day, and you're, you make it. But um, I'm just saying, that, that's the best way I think of dealing with a parent, is showing them that failure will create the rider they need the rider to be, and teaching them to manage expectations by what other riders, who are accomplished riders, are achieving in the class, and how their child or young adult should stack up to that person. I feel like that was so incredible all of a sudden. I'm going to like pee back on a little bit, but basically everything I and then I think like the other part is what she said, it's not being afraid of them. I can be very blunt and I think I think a couple of things like being very direct, being very honest, having a really good program so that like I think having a good program and creating uh, like a program of trust and also like that if you like if the rest of your clients also lead by example, that they trust the program and they trust the training and they look around and they see success, like that that is also like take everything Ashley said and then like add that a little bit to it so that, um, yeah, I, I overall I have to say I've been incredibly lucky, like the young riders and young adults that I've had, have had incredible parents, um, which is really good and the kids have been very self-driven um, with like at that level, so like that's also really good. So, but I think that piece of not being afraid to stand up to them, and I do think that the one piece is also in coaching young people who are starting to become trainers is a piece Lyndon will talk about sometimes too. Is that you know when you're like 25 or 27 and you're dealing with this parent who's like 50 and their kid is like 12. You know, that, that can be a very challenging dynamic, you know, where like the kid is 15 or that piece and having to, that kind of goes into also some of like, you have to make sure your conduct as a trainer commands respect, that you are respectful to your students and the parents and that like that whole way of communication really goes a long way in moments like that and, you know, and that you can say what Ashley said. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that, that add anything? Okay. I think we'll we'll stop with that. Um, I want to thank you all for your attention. I want to thank you all for not freezing to death. <laughs> I'm really sorry. I tried to get it turned down, but it didn't work. Um, and but I just want to finally say um, this is part of our training for teaching program. It's done by Dressage for Kids. I'd love any input of ideas. 
We do have another uh, session that isn't set in stone yet. If anyone knows of a really good speaker uh, or subject that you'd like to cover, please don't hesitate. My email is graydressage at gmail. Um, and uh, I may respond or may respond in three months, but whatever. <laughs> um, <laughs> But, you know, this is a program that we do for you all, and so any input, we love it. So, uh, th yes? Can it be virtual? Can it be virtual? Uh, possibly. When we're here, we like to do it um, but in person because some of the networking that goes on is fantastic. Uh, but we, we do have some others, yes. So, um, again, thank you all. Thank you, Tooney. I hope you all heard me say that. Thank you, Tooney, for helping to make this possible. And thank you to our fabulous panel.